Well, we, we just had a break and Mary needed to have a cry, so she's gone and done that, which is great. Um, and we'll get started again on this issue of faith because it, it's the issue of faith that we wanted to discuss a yep. fair bit about and the understanding, having a good understanding about what faith is and how we can develop faith is an essential part of developing our relationship with God. So what I wanted to perhaps begin with, with this issue of faith, is how our concept of God will determine, and it's not our intellectual concept of God, but rather our emotional concept of God, that is going to determine how much faith we have to actually develop a longing or a desire to receive God's love. Mm -hmm. So the problem that we face is this. At the beginning, we have no faith in God. We have no concept that God has love to give. We have no concept that God even exists most of the time. We have no personal feeling that God exists sometimes. We might have a personal feeling God exists, but we've got no idea how to connect with God generally even if we do have a, a feeling that God exists. We might have a whole heap of false beliefs about God, a whole heap of false beliefs about love, a whole heap of false beliefs about what is truthful or what is the best thing to do, a whole heap of false beliefs about humility. And these, of course, are going to colour what we do in our, with faith. Mm -hmm. So rather than trying to individually get rid of every one of those things that I've just mentioned, you know, our false concept of God, our false concept of faith, our false concept of ourselves, our false concept of truth and all of the untruths that we've imbibed over our life, we can actually put all of that aside for a moment and we can focus primarily on developing faith. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a few key things we need to have faith about. And they all involve God. <laughs> you are not going to have a longing for God when you don't have any, any kind of even intellectual concept of God that is in harmony with the truth about God. Okay. So, for example, if I give some examples. If I don't have the faith that God is merciful and gracious and does not have anger, then I will believe, probably that God would be more like my parent, like my father perhaps, who was angry at times and often was not merciful mm -hmm. and often was not gracious with me as a child. Now, while I hold on to those particular concepts about, I don't have to release those concepts about my father, my earthly father, but I do have to see logically that God can't be that person before I'll develop any longing to actually want God's love in my life. So in other words, while I'm holding on to this concept that God is just a wrathful and punishing God, just like my daddy was, mm -hmm. I'm actually going to not have a desire, a longing to receive God's love in my soul while I'm holding on to that concept. Mm -hmm. I've got to give up this concept inside of myself somehow. So when you say give it up, do I have to... What does that mean? Well, um, and you can ask as many other questions as you want in it as well, darling. Um, when I say give it up, I don't have to give it up the concept about my father, that he was wrathful and that he was sometimes ungracious and he was sometimes unmerciful with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. What I need to do is give up the concept that God's the same as my father in order to actually have a sincere longing for God's love to enter. I need to at least see the potentiality logically that God is not the same as my father. So I'm opening myself to possibilities initially. Exactly. I'm yeah. humble enough to open myself to the new concept about God mm -hmm. that I didn't have before. You see, and unfortunately with a lot of the holy books of the Bible, the Koran and the Bible, um, most of the holy books on earth, they explain the concept of a wrathful God too. So I'm, I'm actually going to have to confront my belief in the Bible and my belief in the Koran to do this mm. because I, I'm going to have to see at some point that no, God is only a God of love. Why would I want love from somebody who's not loving? If I believe God is not loving and God's a God of wrath and potentially destroys people and in the Bible and the Koran, there are examples of God doing that without there even really being a good reason. 
<laughs> and that, of course, causes me to have a lot of fear about God rather than desire for God. Yeah. And, of course, there is a Christian concept that I must have a fear of God. In fact, I just answered last week an email from a chap who said that I should fear God. And I'm saying, no, 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 I don't fear God. I don't fear God at all. Why would I ever fear God? God's a God of love. I don't need to fear anybody who really loves me, ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so these concepts will need to be at least challenged in my mind before I will engage a process of longing for love from the being who I believed was all of these things, uh, you know, that are, that are untrue. And um, if I've if I've if I let myself feel, no, God is a God of love. No, God doesn't want to punish me every time I make a mistake. God knows that God's laws sort out all of that. God, God just feels compassion for me when I make a mistake. Mm. Like God's merciful. So when I am repentant, mercy comes from God. Right. These are all principles I need to start to understand. And this is why I constructed the, what is called the Lord's Prayer, but it's been vastly modified in the Bible. Mm-hmm. But the real Lord's Prayer, I constructed it in such a way to actually expose in the individual their false concept of, of themselves and God. Mm-hmm. And so what you're describing here is the beginning of faith. Well, this is what faith is initially. It's, initially, it's, it's opening just our, an in, a logical intellectual concept. A logical intellectual concept. And I also heard you mention uh, we're opening our heart based on that concept. Is we're that deciding right? to take the risk, risk of our heart based yeah. on logic, yes. based on the fact that we have a logical intellectual concept of God, which is different to our own emotional concept of God Mm -hmm. and also different to our own emotional concept of our current human parents. So so what we're doing is we're saying, right, I realise inside of me I do believe all these bad things about God, right? I believe that God's going to, you know, that I'm angry with God and I'm upset about this and I'm upset about all these different things. And, And I need to understand that this is in my soul. I do need to. And I need to allow the expression of these particular things that are in my soul if they're ever going to be released. I need to have the humility to release them. However, I need to also hold on, at least initially intellectually, to the concept that God is different to the person I feel God to be. Mm. And, I, and I feel God is wrathful. And sometimes I even, might even want God to be wrathful. You know, there's a lot of people on the planet who want God mm-hmm. to be wrathful. They want God to come and punish everybody else other than them. right? So they want God to be wrathful. Mm. And, and I'm going to have to, at some point, give up that concept if I really want to continue receiving divine love from God. To receive divine love from God, I have to have a belief that is at least in harmony with the love being received. And if my belief is that God's not a God of love, then I can't have a longing for God's love. Mm. If my belief is that God's going to be punishing to me, then I can't receive divine love under those circumstances because it's... It, because my concept that I'm holding on to with my will is in direct disharmony with the love itself mm. from entering me. So, One of the things on that point that I had written down here was that faith is believing a right viewpoint of God. Exactly. It's, it's having a belief or exercising our desire even to believe the truth, the truth about, about God, God, which is good things about God, actually. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. That we must exercise our, our intellect at least to see the logic and to see the truth that God exists in the manner that we are not accustomed to, but in a new manner. A different, uh, God is different to the person we believe God to be. Mm-hmm. We need to understand that. Mm. And, and if we don't ever understand it and we're not even willing to intellectually see the difference, then we're never going to open our heart to the difference. So, so to give an example... We get a lot of Orthodox Christians emailing us, condemning me and condemning all of the teachings that I'm, that I'm teaching and stating to me categorically over and over again that, that God is a God of wrath, he's going to punish the wicked and he's going to punish me. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, of course, I don't believe that because I have a relationship with God and I know God's never going to punish me for my actions taken that are, that are in harmony with love. Mm-hmm. So God can't, is, is never going to punish me for that. And God's not going to punish me for, mis- for mistakes I make 
unless the mistakes are out of harmony with love, then, then the laws of God correct me. Mm -hmm. And I don't even see that as a punishment. I just see it as correction, where God's correcting me from my mistakes. Uh, I don't see that, that God's being punishing God under those circumstances. I see that God's just providing me correction here, providing me correction there. And if I'm willing to accept the correction, then I'll have a completely different experience with God. So, so but they're telling me, that God's going to punish me and destroy me and I've got to repent and if I don't repent, and then they tell me all the beliefs I should accept about God, which are all about God being a God of wrath. In fact, the whole idea that God's going to destroy me for making a mistake is all about a God of wrath. Mm -hmm. Now, this is why they can't receive love because they have a false belief about God in that moment. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, they're not acting in harmony with love. Because if they acted in harmony with love, they wouldn't act in harmony with this false belief. They'd realise the truth. Hang on a sec. What I'm telling Jesus is that he's going to be destroyed. <laughs> now, of course, they don't believe I'm Jesus. They believe I'm Alan John Miller and a usurper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they, they're telling Alan John Miller that he's going to be destroyed for being loving and telling truth and preaching concepts of love. In fact, one Christian this week told me, that every single time I talk about love, it's pointless because I'm not Jesus and I claim that I am and because I'm claiming that I am, all of the other works that I do are pointless. And that's what he told me. And I'm going, yeah, you don't understand God at all because everything is about love for God. Mm -hmm. My desire to share about love is about love. My motivations are loving. So you don't know, I'm not afraid of God under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. Why would I ever be afraid of God? If God's a God of love and all God does is ever correct me, all I do is wait for correction. And this is not the correction that I need to take because he's telling me that God's not a God of love. Mm -hmm. He's telling me God's something else, somebody else that I know God doesn't, isn't. Mm -hmm. Now, while that man who did that accepts God as being a wrathful God and accepts that God's going to destroy the wicked at some point in the future, which is not true and it's never going to be true, that man prevents himself from receiving more love. Mm -hmm. His belief is out of harmony with the person who's giving the love. And as, a, as such, the love can't flow. So he needs to have some faith. He needs to give up his beliefs in the Bible being God's word on this matter. And he needs to accept that, no, God's not a God of wrath. God's not a God who's going to just punish us for every mistake that we make. Mm -hmm. God is not vindictive. God's not going to torment me in hell. Mm -hmm. God's not going to place me in hell so that Satan can torment me either, by the way. right? God is a God of love. And if I go to God with that underlying feeling in my soul, now I've got the ability to receive some of that love. And this is where we must have faith that God is different to the person that we've been taught God is. Mm. And if, if we take an example, say, from Joanne Bloggs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you've given an example there of where someone believes in a very angry, punishing God mm -hmm. and that's, prevent that's actually not basing their faith in anything truthful. Exactly. A lot of other people might feel um, that God is... a Feel, say that they believe, no, God is loving. They God say is... God's loving and they say they believe God's loving. Yeah, yeah, but they feel they themselves are not good enough yet. They're to... not lovable. They're not lovable. Yeah. Now, uh, what I find interesting about that belief, which is I'm bringing this example because... I, something you've felt I, yourself. Something that I've felt myself. Yeah. Um, is that we're, we're basing our faith on the fact that we believe God is loving it's just I'm the problem, which actually turns into a reflection onto God, doesn't it? Totally. It's saying that God only loves perfect people or worthy people. Exactly. Or, and, or people that don't make mistakes. So it turns into a faith that is based on untruth about God. Well, it's an untruth about love too, yeah. that yeah. love can't be given to anybody who's not perfect. Mm. It, that's the belief really, that you've yeah. got to try to be perfect and then you'll get love. And, I, and, and I, I can understand why people have that because that's the beliefs they have with their daddies and mummies, right? That, yeah. was the, that was the condition under which they received love when they were growing up. But that's not the, not the condition under which we receive love from God. Mm. And it's actually, so then it actually prevents us acting in faith, asking for love, because we're actually 
trying to make ourselves perfect before we ask for the love. If, yes, if I have a belief in my heart that I have to be perfect before God will love me, then I'm not going to desire God's love when I'm not perfect. Mm. That's the sad thing about it. Yeah. But it's when we're not perfect that we need more of God's love. <laughs> <laughs> and where we end up in this self-reliant thing we talked about earlier, yeah. where we're trying to fix ourselves before we even ask, even act in faith. And remember, we've said right at the beginning of this conversation that fixing ourselves is a long, drawn-out, natural love process. Mm. And allowing God's love to transform our soul is a short thing that deals with the causes. Yeah. So while I'm exercising my will by saying, well, no, I've got to be perfect and not make mistakes before God's going to love me, I am actually on the natural love path. Even though I might believe in all of the concepts of divine truth, mm -hmm. I might believe in, that God is love, and I might believe that because God's love, all of these different things are true, and all those kind of beliefs that are basically just intellectual at this point in my head, they're not in my heart, because I haven't received a line of love to know them in my heart. And, and because of all of that, I'm just still on the natural love path. Mm. I'm still engaging this process where I believe I have to rely on myself to get into a condition before God's going to love me. No. If you truly understood God's love, you'd understand that God already loves you right now, no matter how dark and evil and whatever it is else that you've done in your life and no matter how bad everyone else thinks you are, God loves you. And God's waiting to give you this love but is reliant on your just opening your soul to receive it. And while you hold on to this concept that you're not good enough, you can't receive it. Mm -hmm. Because that's not God's concept of you. Mm -hmm. God's con to, to receive divine love, I have to be in harmony with the truth of God's concept of me. Of me. So do I? But and you just that last even intellectually you said that's what I was going to say. <laughs> exactly. Because I've heard that statement initially, mm -hmm. and I've thought, okay, I have to get into harmony with how God feels about me emotionally. I have to do that before I'll receive the love. But that's skipping over faith, isn't it? It is skipping over faith. But also it is true that you will have to release some emotions in order to have a sincere desire to, to ask for love when you feel bad about yourself. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion to a person who feels bad about themselves is feel bad about yourself. Have a good cry about how bad you are. <laughs> but understand with your mind at least that God will still give you love even though you're bad. Yeah. If you ask for it. And I suppose my experience is that if I act in faith and ask for the love, then all of the feelings that I have that I don't deserve it or that I'm not worth it or I'm not perfect that enough yet to up. receive it, they actually come up more profoundly and mm. intensely than if I just try to feel it on my own and yep. get up the courage to act in faith and ask God for love. Yes. So yep. um, it seems like using our will to in faith yep. it seems to... Even what you said, like get up the courage to ask for God's love. Yeah, that's That is a to... blasphemy towards God in, yeah. a, in a way <laughs> it's because a... it's a belief about God that say, says that we need to be afraid of God somehow. <laughs> like, so it, it itself is a statement of an error that exists in the soul yeah. and that needs to be released. Now, when you receive some of the love from God, you'll realise there was no risk <laughs> there was no risk That's there. right. For me, the yeah. most scary thing would be to ask for love and not receive it uh, because I would view that as something about myself. But that's actually skipping over the, the truth that God always is going to love me if I ask for it sincerely, isn't it? Yeah, but if you think you're asking for it and you don't receive it, right? Yeah. Which is a possibility. Sure. A lot of people do that. Right. They think okay. and they don't receive it. And then the emotion comes up, I'm not worthy to receive it. Understand that while that's an emotion you need to feel, that it's not the truth from God's perspective. Mm. God, God feels that all I, God, the way God feels is if you ask me for love, I'm going to give you some. <laughs> that's how God feels. <laughs> right. I, I have to wait till you ask because you have to exercise your will. Right. And I can't give it to you when you haven't exercised your will because that would be forcing you, and I don't want to force you. My love will never force you. But if you ask, I will always give it. Mm. That's the underlying belief, right? So you're really saying there's two categories of people, people who think they're asking and not receiving, mm -hmm. and then there's people where 
you know, I don't even ask. They're not even asking. Because I, I just feel like I'm not going to get it. Exactly. Because I'm already judging myself so much. And, you, and, and you, of course you can't get it under those circumstances because you're not asking. Exactly. <laughs> That's the and only reason why. It's not because you're bad. <laughs> it's because so you're not asking. It's a sort of like two camps who don't receive God's love is the ones who never actually uh, ask, ask and the ones who tell themselves they're asking but they're but they're arrogant and proud and they've got a heap of blockages which are out of harmony with love that cause them to not receive yeah so so there are and if we analyze why people don't receive divine love both of those are the reasons there are only two reasons in fact why we don't receive divine love one is because we have a feeling inside of us that we we won't ask that's one reason why and the other reason why is because we think we're asking and we're just being arrogant and we've, we've got heaps of blocks that we're not being open to. That's the only other reason why we would not receive divine love when we ask. So, so which one is it? <laughs> That's the question we need to ask. When, ask ourselves when we ask for divine love or we think we're asking for divine love and not receiving it. I'm just stop for a second again. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just, yeah, I just feel that there's still quite a lot of misunderstanding about how the love transforms the soul, right? And you know, that's what, what we, why we brought up this message today. You know, because we, we want to get across the concept that the importance of developing faith in God, that God's nature is good, that God doesn't, you know. That at least even here I have the concept. God's nature is good. God's nature is good. God's nature is good, you know. And then if I have an emotion which says, I hate you, God, didn't feel that. Go and feel that. I hate you, God. Ah, bash, 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 bang, bang, you know. Let it go. So that after that you can have a sincere longing for the love to enter you because you here understand God's nature is good, uh, you know, at least. But, but a lot of people are telling themselves, like, they, they believe here God's nature is good. Here they feel anger or hatred towards God. They don't release the emotion because they feel it's a negative emotion that's bad and they'll get punished for it and it's wrong. And God already knows. God already knows, yeah. 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 So th the reality is that we have this concept of God that is flawed so much. It's really deeply flawed. And as a result of the deep, and we can include this, as a result of the deep flaws that we have in our concept of God, which is about faith, a lack of faith in God, we have these deep flaws. So because we lack faith, we do not engage prayer. Mm. And, and prayer is the thing that opens our soul to the reception of love. Prayer is the longing towards God, the desire for God's love to enter my soul. When I lack faith in God, I don't have a longing for God. I don't, so I don't pray. I won't pray. I'll refuse to pray. Mm. And, and that's the problem is that we re, most of us are refusing to pray and then we're going, I'm on the divine love path. How can you be on the divine love path when you're refusing to pray and you're not receiving divine love? You're on the natural love path. <laughs> you're not on the divine love path. When you're on the divine love path, you want this relationship with God as your number one priority. That's why I said in the first century, very first commandment, uh, you know, when I was asked what, what are the two, what, what, what are the things that you would say to us as the most important things for our life? Love God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, your whole strength. Have a concept of God that God, as to why you would love God as well. Like, don't, don't believe that God is wrath. Don't believe that God is punishing. Don't believe any of these things. They're all false. And every time you hold on to the belief of these things, you are not going to pray. You are not going to have a longing for God. You are better off if you feel angry with God, go out and have a bash and yell and scream and swear at God. Get it out of your system. <laughs> Get it out of your feelings, you know, so that you can go to God with a sincere feeling, I do want to receive love from you because I know that you're not the God that I imagined you to be. Yeah. Do you say that any time we just really open ourselves sincerely towards God, whatever feeling we encounter is going to be the block to why we're not even asking or praying. Exactly, yeah. But a lot of us even have fear of doing that, don't we? Yes. We have fear of... So emotional processing, if we can call it such a thing, mm. is, is actually very simple. Mm. When I long for God's love to enter, there'll be a fear that comes up or some other false belief that comes up inside of my soul, and there's the emotion. 
pretty easy. Feel that one and <laughs> you'll have some more of God's love into you. Take away some of these causes that are inside of you mm -hmm. and, and then those causes won't motivate future events as long as you live in harmony with the love that exists inside of you already, as long as you choose to act. Now, if you choose to act in fear, then of course you're not living in harmony with the love that's there already. So work through your fear. Let yourself feel your fear so that you, so that you don't honour your fear. You honour the love. Mm. You honour the love even though you're afraid. Mm. Right? That's what a person who receives divine love does. A person who doesn't receive divine love honours their fear every single time, whether, you know, whatever love they have, they honour their fear every single time. A person who receives divine love and is sincere in their relationship with God receives divine love, feels the love motivating them down a certain point, feels the fear get triggered, and then, of course, they go, okay, what's wrong here? Not the love. <laughs> it's the fear. That's the thing I need to throw out here. So I let myself feel it. I experience it. Throw it out the window by experiencing it. Allow yourself to experience the fear. Allow yourself to shake and do whatever you need to experience the fear. So that And hold on to the love. Hold on to the love that you've received. Base every decision that you make upon the love that you've received. And even if we haven't yet received a love on the faith that we've just been discussing? If, yes, base your decisions on the, on the faith, faith. That, yeah. of the truth. Mm -hmm. God's not a love, God is not a punishing God. God is always loving. God is not a wrathful God. God is not wanting to hold all my mistakes against me. God, God wants to forgive me, mm -hmm. right? I just need to enter the state where that's possible. That's all I need to do. That's my will. That's the exercise of my will. That's me having faith in God's nature, right? I need to have faith in God's true nature. I need to believe or at least intellectually start accepting the truth about God. And whenever I notice an emotion in me that's completely opposite of that, I need to experience it. I need to get rid of it. I need to release it. If I release that emotion, now my longing will be strong. So, so if I'm angry with God, instead of suppressing it, Go out and bash something and bash it and bash it and swear and scream at God and carry on for as long as it takes for you to get rid of that emotion. Don't sit on it. Don't try and hold it at bay because you're afraid that God will punish you further for, for expressing it. Don't do any of those things. Let go of the emotion so that you can come to God and feel like you want love from God. So you feel like you want it. And if you have an emotion that I'm not worthy, now you know that's not true. Here you might know it's not true. You're being told it's not true. It is not true. God feels that every one of her children are worthy to receive love, no matter whether they're in the deepest, darkest hells or in the pinnacle so far of, God's, of reception of God's love. God knows that every one of them is deserving the same amount of receiving God's love. So if we know that, at least intellectually, we won't stop asking God for more love just because we feel bad about ourselves. We won't do that. And we won't ask God for more love because we feel bad about ourselves. Mm. We won't do that either. We'll ask God for more love because we have a strong desire to receive it. We want this relationship with God established. This is what it means to have faith in the truth about God. Uh, this is the kind of faith we need to develop. Now, obviously, as we receive more love, and the causes of any in disharmonious things within us get released as a result of receiving the love, the love dissolving those particular causes, then of course we'll have more faith after the process begins. Yep. But right at the beginning, we probably have none whatsoever. <laughs> and that's something we must, we must work on and establish. Learn about the truth, learn of the truth about God. And the truth about God is completely different to what the world's religions are teaching you. The truth about God is completely the opposite, in fact, of what the world's religions are teaching you. So that, I suppose, then brings us to the prayer, mm. doesn't it? Um, do you have any more questions, babe, about the, about no, the faith? No, I was just going to say that Solomon even says in his message that love will come to you and with it faith. So we exercise the faith, we pray, then the love comes, we get and, more faith. And we get and some more becomes, faith. Yeah, yep. it becomes yep. an ongoing. Because we're now having an experience with God that we feel. And whenever you have an experience you can feel, your faith exponentially grows. Mm. So instead of it being now just a logical, intellectual concept of truth that, is, that we've based our faith upon, now we know it to be true because we've experienced something that tells us that it's true, mm -hmm. as well as the logical concept. That logical concept is still existing, but now there's the addition of the experience, which of course will grow more faith. 
It's a natural result. So it's the beginning of this process that um, it's like the first hurdle to get over to really begin to develop this faith yep. before we've received the love. Then it, it grows and sort of fosters itself as exactly. it goes along. Exactly. As we receive more love and we act in harmony with that love, our faith continues to grow and obviously the causal emotions get removed so it's easier mm -hmm. to act in harmony with the faith. The more love that we've received from God, the easier it becomes to act in harmony with the love that we've received, not harder. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like a struggle all the rest of my life as the Christian religion would teach you. It's not like that at all. It, it, it becomes easier and easier and easier to act in harmony with the love because we have more love in our soul as a result. And it's not an intellectual process, is it? Um, you no. just naturally act in harmony with the love so it's effortless even. It's effortless it, and done without even thought. Yeah. You don't even think about the decision you made because it's a natural decision. Mm -hmm. It's a decision because the nature of your soul has changed to become more loving it's natural for the soul to make the more loving decision mm -hmm. every single time. And if it's not natural for the soul to make a more loving decision, then you haven't actually changed. Yeah. You've, just, you've just imbibed an intellectual belief that has yet to touch your soul, mm. that has yet to change you. And it's an indication that you're not receiving divine love as well. If you're having to struggle all the time to live in harmony with the love, then it means that you haven't received it. <laughs> Because if you receive it, it is not a struggle to act in harmony with it. It's an automatic process mm -hmm. to act in harmony with it. So, so, for example, when I talk to people about telling the truth, if it's a struggle to tell the truth, then you've not received enough love yet to enter you into the second sphere of the spirit world mm -hmm. from God. Because, because in the second sphere of the spirit world, you learn that it's not a struggle to tell the truth when you have enough love in your soul. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so that means if, you, if you're still struggling with telling the truth, not enough love has entered you yet to enter the second sphere. So, so, so go, okay, that's because of my lack of faith yes. and desire, yeah. longing for it. It's not because of I'm a bad person. It's not because I've made mistakes. It's not because of some badness that I did in the past. It's or not because of any of those it's things. It's not because, you know my parents and I'm a victim or... Yeah, it's, it's not because of any because... of my parents' emotions even. Mm -hmm. It's not, not because of any of the emotions inside of me that I still need to release. It's because I have yet to receive enough love from God that would have changed all of these things in my soul. And, and once I acted in harmony with that love, I would have to speak the truth. I couldn't avoid it. I couldn't, I couldn't try to get away with it. And every time I didn't speak the truth, I'd go, oh, that's terrible. I can't do that ever again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's what will happen because it will be a natural state of the soul to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And then we won't be asking questions about, oh, when should I tell the truth? Why should I tell the truth in that situation? We won't even ask any of those questions because all the love in our soul dictates every answer automatically we don't have to struggle, we don't have to question, we don't have to do any of those things. It's an automatic response that we're going to enter truth every single time. Mm -hmm. so, so I feel it's very important for people to understand this role of faith and very important for people to understand that the love does the transformational work. So if we understand that love from God, the greatest thing in the universe that I've discovered, enters the soul, tra does the transformational work on the soul, and my job, if I have one, is to allow it in, mm -hmm. to long for it to come in. And anything that's inside of me that stops me from longing for it to come in, I need to have some real focus on letting it go mm. instead of holding on to it. Because it's true, isn't it? As the love enters me, it will. there's a disharmony between it and any unlovingness within me. Yes. And so... That unlovingness is actually a resistance to love entering me. It is. So it, if as it enters me, I'm willing to just experience that unlovingness or the pain or whatever. And go into a state of repentance for the unlovingness we've previously, you know, taken. Because yep. it's sort of like the divine love is a flashlight on it all of a sudden. Yeah, Whoa, kind of, you can feel it suddenly really a bright, strongly. bright light on <laughs> the problem. Yeah. <laughs> if you like. And if we're, if we're willing to feel that, then, and we've got to be willing to feel. So that's the humility. We've then, got to be willing to feel. Yeah. Then we've re removed another resistance to receiving the love. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But the and cause, that, the cause of what caused our sinful behaviour, God's love transforms. So it's not us that actually is transforming our soul anymore as it is on the natural love path. 
on the divine love path, God's love is transforming our soul and we're just willing and humble about going through the process with God. Yeah. We're willing to see when we're out of harmony with truth. We're humble about whenever we, we obviously have an untruth. We don't try to fight for it. We're willing to see it. We're willing to feel it inside of us, feel the unloving feelings that are inside of us as a result of that. We, we can feel that because they've just been exposed to us and we go, wow, yeah, I do feel that. Wow. You know, and, the, and we see it as a problem. Yeah. We see it as something that we need to address and be willing to release. So it's sort of like the contrast between God's love and what's inside of us helps build the impetus or the, the knowledge of the error. Exactly. Whereas if we do it on our own, on the natural love path, we're having to bumble our way along, use our intellect to analyse this. Is this unloving? Is this loving? Gee, it's hard to tell because I've got this emotion from my parents that said it was loving, but yeah. never loving. You know, it becomes... But whereas when God is like this big, massive spotlight torch onto this thing and we can feel, wow, the contrast between this love and this thing inside of me... It's so great. It's so great. It's and what am I going to choose to do? Yeah. Now, this is where we need to use our will. Because what a lot of people do when they have the spotlight of God's love put on something in their soul, they fight mm -hmm. for their soul retaining the error. Mm -hmm. And that, that is using your soul in a complete disharmony with the love you've just received. If you were in harmony with the love you received, you'd see the error, notice the error, feel the error and become repentant for the error. And in that process, then God's love can enter you about that error and make that error clean. <laughs> yeah. All right? Now, unless we engage that process, that error will remain in us unless we go through a process of natural love where we slowly, slowly, slowly try to work through the error and eventually release it. What I'm suggesting is you don't have to do that. If you're humble, you, you can see the error immediately when you've received divine love, any new error that's exposed, and you can ask for God to forgive that error too. You can ask for God love to come and do its transformational work mm -hmm. on that error and get rid of that error for you as well. And once that error is gone, all of those sins that you would have committed, all the things you would have done had you had that error retained within you, can no longer be performed. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you're not going to cause further damage to yourself or other people mm -hmm. because you've allowed God's love to do the transformation. Okay, yep. so, so this begins with faith. So, yeah, yeah. If, we, if we look at it all, the whole process begins with God's love, really. Mm -hmm. But in terms, of how, if, uh, in terms of ourselves, it begins with faith. Mm -hmm. we, we have to have at least some faith in God and God's goodness and God's love. Otherwise, we'll never ask for it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it begins with faith. It begins with faith and this other element or, which leads us into prayer. Exactly. So should we talk about prayer now? Now, let's look at the physical operation of prayer. Mm -hmm. What the physical operation of prayer does is it exposes the soul to the inflow of love. That's what it does physically. In other words, before prayer is engaged, there is no desire in the soul for the reception of love. So you could say that our soul is closed. It's like we're doing this to God. <laughs> We're saying, no, no, stay away from me, God, right? Don't, 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 I'm not going to let any of you into me. Mm. That's really what we're saying. We're exercising our will before we engage prayer. We're exercising our will to not have any of God enter us. When we start prayer, when we pray, it has, it has an opera two operations, actually. One is that it opens up our own soul to the reception of love. By having a desire and longing for love to enter us, our soul becomes open to the love's reception. Before then, our, love's, our soul is not open to the love's reception. Mm -hmm. But now this prayer, this development of this desire, and remember it's a desire, a passionate longing for God's love to enter us, not, not an intellectual thought. It's a feeling that exists within us that we desperately would love to have God's love enter us. Right? and it's a passionate, longing-based desire, that has the effect of opening our soul and preparing our soul for the inflow of the love. Mm -hmm. It also has the subsequent effect of connecting us to the conduit of love, which is the Holy Spirit. So in other words, it draws, it draws out of God the desire 
to lo for love to flow as well to us. Mm -hmm. So in other words, God is saying to us, when our soul is closed like this, God is saying to us, I cannot try to give you my love. Because to try to give you my love while you're not wanting to receive it would be an imposition against your will. And I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit is with God under those circumstances. God's Spirit, which is the conduit through which the love can flow, is with God. But when, there, when we have a longing directed towards God of prayer, it's like sucking this conduit to ourselves, to our soul. Yeah. It's like a... <laughs> and we get this beautiful connection then, which is this connection with the Holy Spirit driven by our desire for receiving love. And once the Holy Spirit connects with our soul, now the love can flow. So you could say the second operation is the response of God's soul to our longing. Mm -hmm. you, see, you see, God does not respond to a soul that does not have longing or desire. Mm -hmm. And there's a very good reason, because if God responded to the souls that did not have longing and desire, God would be imposing love upon them which would be breaking the principles of free will. Mm -hmm. So God cannot respond to the souls of people who do not have a desire for God. That makes sense, of course, right? Yeah. So from our perspective, when we open, when we pray, when we have a sincere longing to God for love, we pray. Not only does it have the first primary effect of opening our own soul to the potential of reception of divine love, but it also has the, has the effect of petitioning God's soul for the reception. Mm -hmm. In other words, God's going, wow, there's a person, there's a person, mm -hmm. there's a person who wants some love from me, right? And God gets very excited about that, of course, because most people initially on the planet have no idea that they can long for God. And so as soon as God feels this longing from you, this sincere longing, God's Holy Spirit instantly responds, bang, to the person and love begins to flow. Mm -hmm. Now, this love flowing will cause the person to potentially go into other emotions because as soon as the love starts flowing, it starts highlighting other emotional areas that are out of harmony with love inside of the person. Mm -hmm. And if the person's humble, they'll probably start crying. They'll probably have a good cry, you know, and a big, a big response to, to the, the flow of the love inside of them. But as soon as they stop praying, it has this effect. Mm -hmm. Closes up the soul again. Right? And so God's Holy Spirit now has to withdraw, if you like, back to God, waiting, waiting for the longing again, for the sincere longing to come from the soul. When the longing comes from the soul and it's sincere, it opens up again. Now my heart, my soul is receptive to the reception of love. And because this longing is going to God, the petition to God's soul is please give me the love, and God's soul automatically and instantly responds to this longing in my heart, automatically and instantly. It's not something that God gives you two weeks later <laughs> or anything like that. It's an instant response to the prayer, the supplication, going towards God to receive love. Then let's say I've received it and I'm becoming overwhelmed emotionally and I decide to close it all down because I'm overwhelmed emotionally. Now I'm all closed again. Now God's Holy Spirit's got to withdraw back to God again, waiting for the next opportunity mm -hmm. for the love to flow. And, and obviously, the more I can open it, the more often I can open it, and the longer periods which I can stand at being opened. Mm -hmm. In other words, I become more emotionally, allow myself to be more emotionally overwhelmed by the process, the more love I'm going to receive until such a point that I'm always open and always longing. Mm. And that point will be when you're at one with God. And you mentioned that it's overwhelming emotionally. Yes. And it is always overwhelming emotionally. Of when course. We God's it is love. a love that does not exist in your own soul. Of course it's going to overwhelm you every time. It's a love that stretches your soul. It changes and transforms your soul. It's going to overwhelm you every time. Mm -hmm. you, cannot, you cannot not be overwhelmed by it. Mm. It's impossible to be overwhelmed, not be overwhelmed by God's love entering your soul no matter what condition you're in, because God's love is infinite. So it is infinite in terms of its largeness. So that means that you, you finite person, it doesn't matter how developed you are, you might be in the seventh sphere, the 20th sphere, whatever sphere you're in, it doesn't really matter. Whenever you receive it, you're going to be overwhelmed <laughs> because 
God's love is always bigger and brighter and more ha happier than you are currently. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you are always going to feel overwhelmed. Now, we need to get used to being overwhelmed emotionally. Yeah. That's one of the things we learn on the path, that you become used to the fact that you get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. You become okay with it. <laughs> you, don't, you don't try to fight it all the time. You don't try to prevent it. Yeah. And in fact, you love it because it feels alive and it feels, you feel connected with, it, with God in particular and yourself in that moment. And so you keep it open for as long as possible. And, and eventually you'll keep it open all the time. Once all the errors have flowed out and all the pain and suffering has gone as a result of the errors that are, that are flowing out of the soul, once all the pain and suffering has been released, now you'll be able to keep it open all the time with no pain and suffering involved. There's still, though, the feeling of being overwhelmed. So you need to be, allow yourself to be overwhelmed as much as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, of course, God's love will continue flowing even after you've hit a one with God. You'll continue to grow and continue to grow. And, and I feel that's the process of prayer. That's the operation of prayer. That's the operation. And so Solomon is saying, basically, you need faith. You need faith because you'll never from, engage prayer without faith. From what you've just said, faith is actually the thing that enables us to have this opening because the it's willingness only to take a risk with our soul yeah, yeah and we're risking the truth about god really we're risking to learn another truth and to, to yeah. enter this relationship and, and when i say the word risk i'm saying it's not a risk but from our perspective it may be one because you know we've we've closed down our souls a lot generally we've had a lot of dark and damaging things happen to us over our life on earth many times you know, we've, we've risked our heart in the past and, and got hurt. Many of us, most of us have gotten hurt through what we believed love to be. And as a result of that, we do feel that this relationship we've got is a risk. Mm. The reality is, how can the relationship with the universal creator who loves us intensely ever be a risk? <laughs> it can't be ever a risk. And any risk that we feel in the relationship is obviously an error. Mm. Yeah. But it it's, is a feeling we'll need to feel. Yeah, mm. yeah. And especially initially, it's sort of a feeling that comes up. It's usually a large of feeling. The fear, yeah, <laughs> yeah because of the fear. That's inside of us. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. But so, from what you just said, though, faith is the thing that enables us to have sincere prayer that's based in truth yes. about God. Yes. And it's those, that kind of prayer with faith that allows God's love to enter us. Well, because prayer um, has, the open, has the effect of those two effects. So that's the important thing to remember. It has the effect of opening the soul to the reception of love. In other words, the soul taking the risk, if, mm -hmm. it, if we can conceive it that way. And also drawing the, de the desire draws God's soul to us. Mm -hmm. It draws God desiring this connection with us. And God existing outside of this universe can, can through this connection, pump us full of divine love because we've now sent a message to God and, and our soul is actually physically open to the reception of that love. Mm. And the message we're sending to God is our desire. Our, our pure desire is the message to God going that, that God's soul responds to, that God wants to respond to because he can feel the longing coming from you. And, and it's God's desire to respond to such longings. Mm. Every single time. And this is why Solomon told us these are, these are the greatest truths. Of course. <laughs> because this amazing dynamic commences prayer and faith on our part, yep. the love of God from God, and suddenly what you talked about in the beginning, transformation begins to happen. Yes. So I suppose now the question becomes, well, okay, what correct views of God and ourselves are required in order for us to have some faith Mm -hmm. And therefore and to have a greater longing for God. Prayer. Yes. So, so perhaps if we just go through the prayer that I gave Paget, which is the prayer that I also gave the first century disciples, that you will see that the prayer itself explains every truth that we need in order to have a desire for God that comes from a condition of faith. Mm -hmm. so, so if we read through the prayer, and this we've, we've taken a modern translation of the prayer here, and what we've done is put it in the first person uh, in, so, that, so that it's something that I'm saying to God rather than we are saying. And, and as we look through this, we'll see the primary beliefs about God and ourselves that we need to engage yes. 
in order to have and have some faith in in order to, re to receive divine love. Mm. So, so if we read paragraph by paragraph, perhaps, sure. um, if you want to start with the first sure. one, and 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 then we can explain the con the concepts of God that are explained in each paragraph. Yeah. My Father who is in heaven, I recognise that you are all holy and loving and merciful and that I am your child and not the subservient, sinful and depraved creature that false teachers would have me believe. Okay, there's already a lot in the first paragraph, isn't there? Like, if we look at it, we can see that we're saying about, what are we saying about God? That God is all holy. In other words, God is pure mm -hmm. and loving mm -hmm. and merciful. That God feels a feeling of mercy towards us. So these are the these are the qualities in God that we can begin to have faith in. That's right. We need to at least have faith that God is holy, that it, God is pure, and God is loving, and God is merciful, before we'll actually develop within ourselves a desire to long for God's love. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, you think, what well, what's the opposite of holy? You think God's some <laughs> dirty creature, right? <laughs> Flawed and loving yeah. hate who hates us. Yeah. And is not merciful, or the opposite of merciful, Punishing. wants to punish us yeah. until we're into smithereens. You know, like the hellfire teaching basically tells you, you know, that kind of belief system is completely the opposite to the, our ability to receive divine love. Mm -hmm. So while we're accepting that belief inside of ourselves, we're not going to receive very much divine love mm -hmm. because it's completely the opposite of God's tr of the truth about God, yeah. that God is merciful. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the second part of it, which is, what we are. Mm. And it's important, isn't it? To, 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 because these statements about us relate... Are just as important. Yes, and they relate to God also. They relate to our concept of God. Yes. That's correct. So um, the second part says that I am your child. Right. Just this alone for us to have faith in So I'm in not this. some self-made God <laughs> and I'm also not some insignificant person. Yes. I am actually God's child. Yes. Yeah. And not the subservient, sinful and depraved creature that false teachers would have me believe. Yes. So, so there's um, a lot of truth in that. Like, you are not subservient. You are equal to every other child. You are not sinful by nature. You are only sinful by your own decisions. Mm -hmm. You're not sinful by nature. And you're not depraved by nature. Mm -hmm. You're only depraved through your own decisions. Yes. Right, this is a very important point. And also this concept that the false teachers would have me believe. Well, why would a teacher want me to believe that I am bad? Isn't that so that they could control me? Of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course they want us to believe bad things about ourselves so that they can control us. Yes. Right. Yeah. Any t person who wants you to believe something bad about yourself that's not true is just wanting to control you in the yeah. end. Yeah. So this is equally important, really, that mm -hmm. we begin to have faith that God is holy, loving and merciful, but also that we are his child and that we're not these terrible things that false teachers and people in our past have led exactly. us to believe. Because if we say that we are subservient to God and sinful and depraved, and subservient here is also subservient to God. Mm -hmm. Like there's a, God didn't create us to be subservient to God. God created us to exercise our own will in harmony with love. Mm -hmm. There's two very different states, very right? Different, yeah. so, so whenever we believe we are is subservient or sinful and depraved, what we're actually saying is we're actually making a comment about God as well as ourselves. We're saying that God created a creature that is depraved by nature. Mm -hmm. And we're saying that God created a creature that is sinful by nature and that God created a creature only for God's own pleasure. Mm -hmm. Now, now, if I had a child only for my pleasure, I'd be called narcissistic and stupid and also probably I'd be classified as someone who's quite dark in their treatment of the child, right? And that's what we're doing with God. By saying that we are subservient, we are basically saying that God created a subservient person in order for what? For some, some of God's narcissistic pleasure to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. God's not a narcissist. So, so no, God didn't create us as subservient. God gave us, as the pinnacle of God's creation, God gave us free will. That, that means we're not subservient, that we can exercise our will in any way we wish. Right? Yeah, and this is where us having faith in God, the truth about God, actually begins to change our own self-concept. Already. Yeah. Yeah. Even from an intellectual perspective, we start going, okay, yeah, I can feel that I don't feel that. <laughs> 
I can see that if this is true, I don't feel it. So mm. already I know that I'm going to have to have release some emotions about these things mm. as I receive love. Because if, if, if inside of myself I feel sinful and depraved and subservient, then, then already I know that I'm going to have some emotions to release. But already if I, if I believe those things and I believe I'm God's child, oh, hang on, I've got I, that also, and that doesn't match with a holy, loving, merciful God. So oh. something about my concept of God, in changing my concept of God automatically, even having faith in a different concept of God, automatically gives me a different faith in myself, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. It, it will cause, it will at least begin the, the, the transformational process in your soul, even just the awareness. Yeah begins it. But you can also see in this first paragraph that if we believe that God is pure and loving and merciful, right, and that God did not create us to be sinful and subservient, mm -hmm. then already we are starting to understand a lot of God's nature. Mm -hmm. and, and even if we don't believe it, right, just us thinking, having thoughts about this will start us on the proper road to, to at least starting to conceive a different truth than what we've been taught. Mm. And, and as you said, even if it's not in our hearts as belief yet, yep. we can begin to act in harmony with it. We can um, exercise faith to actually let our actions be guided. We don't have to be... Exactly. So stop acting like you're a depraved creature mm. and stop telling yourself that you are a depraved creature and that's why you acted depraved. <laughs> stop telling yourself, you know, take some responsibility for the fact that it's a choice within you yes. to act in these manners. Yes. So there's a lot that comes in with these, uh, this under proper understanding as we get more and more understanding. In fact, the person who, res who reads this prayer when they first read it, we'll go, oh, that's pretty basic, I'll do that. Yeah. But, but, you know, when you become at one with God, you'll then understand the prayer yeah. properly. Yeah. <laughs> Before then, you won't understand yeah. the prayer properly, but there's all this meaning in the prayer. A lot. A lot yeah. of meaning in the prayer. So let's continue. All right. I know that I am the greatest of your creations and the most wonderful of all of your handiworks and the object of your great soul's love and tenderest care. Wow. There's like, a lot in there. Yeah. There's a lot in there about me in terms of what I must come to know, even if I don't know it currently, mm. that I'm the greatest of God's creations, that the human soul is the greatest of God's creations, that's the most wonderful of all of God's... We're, we're now acknowledging that God created the universe as well, not just ourselves, mm -hmm. but we are the greatest of those creations. We're, we're also acknowledging that God has love and tender care for us, not... It hasn't just shoved us on the earth to fend for ourselves, yes. as people believe, yeah. but rather God wants to give us all the knowledge and all of the facts about the universe in which we live. It's just whether we're open to receiving it or not that, that, that will depend on whether we receive. Mm -hmm. So again, a whole heap of truth about God yes. yeah. that's contained in the prayer. I know that your will is that I become at one with you and partake of your great love which you have bestowed upon me through your mercy and desire that I become, in truth, your child through love and not through the sacrifice and death of any of your creatures. So again, a whole heap of truth about myself and God mm -hmm. contained in another paragraph, pregnant with information. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yes. As long as we are able to receive it, we'll, we'll see the birth of the information. <laughs> well, and, and in, in this paragraph, um, it's, we're told or we can have faith in the fact that God is mercy, which yes. was mentioned earlier. That God has a but desire. desire. That I become at one. It's not like, oh God, the option. God's there. not going to us. If you want it. If you want it, you can take it. Yeah. Take it or leave it. Don't worry, man. No. No, God's... it does. God says, God says, I want you to take it. Yeah. But I, I honor the free will that I've given you. Yes. And um, the will is, is so much that you become my child, not just through the fact that I created you, but through receiving this love. Yes. And not just receiving a little bit to the point of at one with you. Exactly, that I can become at one with you. Yep. And then the last part of this paragraph that says, and not through the sacrifice and death of any of your creatures. Yeah. Now, obviously, um, there's a huge Christian belief that says that the, your death was the sacrifice and that's how people come to God. Mm -hmm. So I feel that that's addressing that false belief. It is. 
But, but, but there's also, more, because remember it, it, I stated this prayer to people before I died. Yes. So there's a lot more to that statement than about my own death. Yes, uh, and that's what I'd like to talk about, yeah. Yep. Yep. The fact that um, so many of us believe that love is about self-sacrifice. Uh, and that's how so many people could take on the belief that your death of course. was... You know, um, parents, are taught, parents teach their children from a very young age they have to sacrifice for the family and that, and yeah. that will prove that they love the family. Yeah. Not true. Yeah. Sacrifice proves nothing about love, in fact. In fact, what sacrifice proves is the person who's demanding the sacrifice is unloving. Yeah. That's what sacrifice actually proves. Yeah. So, so the reality is that that firstly sacrifice would never be demanded of a god of love from a god of love yes and so what when i what i think of when i read this is that god does not desire my sacrifice in order to receive his love mm-hmm. but also if i desire for God to, to sacrifice, sacrifice one me. of his laws <laughs> exactly. for me to show that he loves me. Yeah. Well, hang on. Now or, or, I'm or I desire my partner to sacrifice, sacrifice something of their desires in order to prove they love me. Yes, I, I, that I'm not going to receive divine love, basically. It, While I'm doing such I'm a thing. I'm learning that sacrifice and death and, and I, are out of harmony with receiving divine love. Mm. I also, when I read this part of the prayer... Think about the death, and this might be out of left field, of creatures. Yes. Eating animals. Like a lot of Christians... I'm loving myself by eating some meat because I need protein. Yes. It's another example of living out of harmony with the, pr- pr- the principle of this particular paragraph. And Yeah, and this, um, this paragraph tells me no sacrifice of death of any creature. Any, any creature. Any. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to become God's true, God's true child in love, yeah. but it's never going to be through the sacrifice and death of any other creature. Exactly. So how can I eat another creature or even eat, use or eat the products of any other creature? Yeah. Because that's about their sacrifice. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So we would no longer demand sacrifice from any of God's creatures. Mm-hmm. We would no longer put in a pen a cow just so that we can have milk, for example. Yeah. We might go out in the field and get some (laughs) (laughs) and chase the cow down (laughs) if it's willing to be milked out there. But we wouldn't put it in a pan and and do it that way. You know what I mean? We would never demand the sacrifice of its life in order for it to give something to us. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. If we were loving. If we were loving. Yeah. Okay. And we wouldn't demand the sacrifice of its life or its normal, Uh, natural life in terms of what it would normally do. Yeah. 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 So, so here again, a lot of truth about God and a lot of truth about our soul and a lot of truth about ethical principles that will help us connect to God mm-hmm. in one paragraph. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Um, it's my turn, isn't yes, it? it? Yes, I pray that you will open up my soul to the inflowing of your love and that then will come to me, your Holy Spirit, to bring into my soul this divine love, your divine love, in great abundance until my soul is transformed into the very essence of yourself and that there will come to me faith, such faith as will cause me to realise that I am truly, I am, truly am your child and at one with you in very substance and not in image only. Mm -hmm. Now, when we pray to open up, when we pray, as I mentioned, we are, our soul is actually opening it up to the inflow of love. But this particular paragraph refers also to the fact that when the love enters our soul, it softens it. Mm. It makes it more malleable to change. Yeah. It helps us become more sensitive creatures. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, we become, again, even more open to receiving more love. And this is uh, often when we meet certain people, whether they have been following the teachings of divine truth or or not or not yeah there's some people where you can feel that they've received divine love because Definitely. there is this softness in them yes that sometimes they're acting in harmony with sometimes just harmony but there's a quality to them yes that you can feel that this thing has happened with god that's that, the, that the transformational effect of god's love has already begun yes. working on their soul yes yes yeah no, that's very true and I suppose in looking at this paragraph, I also, um, I suppose it's showing me that 
my will is involved to open to open up, but not just a little bit of God's love because, you know, often this can be a part of prayer as well. I just have a little bit, not so much that's going to overwhelm me. Give me because, a touch of it yeah, yeah. because I'm a bit afraid to receive any more. Exactly. <laughs> the sort of being overwhelmed is freaking me out. Yeah. This part of the prayer is telling me, no, I'm asking to open up and for God to open me even more so that I can receive the love in great abundance. And for God to open me up so much that, that I'm like overwhelmed by the love mm-hmm. that I'm receiving mm. constantly. Mm. And, and like there's also this feeling also that it's attacking and this is, this is this feeling of lack that we have a tendency to have, you know, like, um, you know, I can't ask for too much because, you know, maybe God hasn't got enough to give other people then, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and now that would be selfish and I'm not really that good yeah. enough and all those kinds of... All those of kind of thoughts, thoughts. This, kind of, this kind of uh paragraph will trigger, yes. you know, will start to feel these particular feelings. So <laughs> we're really saying all the way through, aren't we, if, if we engage our heart with these words, um, this is how we begin to exercise faith, but also it starts to trigger all these emotions that we have yep. that are in disharmony with this exactly with these concepts yeah. and also we're now building through logic we're building an, a concept about god mm. that god, god's not the same as what we've brought up you know in terms of our parents to be you know we we we, we, we often impose our parental concepts the, the the beliefs we have about our parents upon god mm-hmm. and this is this is now confronting those concepts and saying, no, no, God is not like your mum and dad. Yeah. God's very, very different to your mum and dad. Mm-hmm. The way God loves is very different to your mum and dad. And also the, God's desires and God's nature is very different to your mum and dad's nature and desires. Mm. And we need to come to understand that so that we can have enough faith to have a longing to receive love from this person, this yeah. being that, that we want to enter a relationship with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So you're next, yeah. Let me have such faith as will cause me to know that you are my Father and the bestower of every good and perfect gift and that only I myself can prevent your love from changing me from the mortal to the immortal. Yeah, so, you know, many people who talk about divine truth believe that, you know, there's nothing we can do um, to stop God's love from transforming us. And that's not true. Mm. You know, obviously we can exercise our will and completely stop God's love from transforming us. And in fact, the majority of people on the planet are doing that. And, and quite a lot of people in the spirit world, in the hells of the spirit world, are doing that as well, right as we speak. So, so the reality is we can, we are the persons who can prevent the God. Love. And the way we prevent God is by exercising our will. God honours our will, yeah. exercised in a direction. So if we exercise our will to prevent God, then God is prevented. Mm. God is prevented through the creation of his gifts to give us any further things. So I see sometimes people arguing that God can never be prevented from doing anything. And I can't agree with that. Yeah. God, God has given us the free will so that we can prevent God. <laughs> Well, and because God is a God of love, then God won't override will. Unloving people try to override will, yes. but God never does. So God is prevented because he gave us this gift of free will. That's exactly. really what you're saying. Isn't so, it? so we cannot assume that every single being in the universe will become at one with God mm. because there is the potential that beings in the people, you know, human, pe- human people, human souls, will make the choice where they don't want to exercise their will in the direction of receiving love from God. And this is an even further demonstration of God's love. And this, yes. like if you think yes. about it, how loving is that to I create think. a creature that, that has that and give them the willpower that they can then express to even deny your very existence. <laughs> yes. Now that, that is an expression of immense amount of love. And you will respect it. And you will respect it. That's very loving. That's it's a very saying, loving position. Wow, you know, even though I created you and I'm the giver of every everything. good and perfect gift in your and life. And every material thing that you have and every, everything yeah. you've ever got has all come from me. I will not demand a thing from you. Including demand that you even acknowledge me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, so. that, is the, that is the intensity of God's love. You look at the average parent, what do they do? Your, I'm your mother. I'm your mother. 
<laughs> I gave birth I to I gave you. birth to you. You know, completely the opposite of God's love. If God was like that, God would be saying, I'm your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your mother. I gave birth to you, you to your soul. I demand that you do yeah. this or do that. Yeah. God's not like that at all. Every time we go, I'm your mother, or I'm your father, you've got to listen to me, completely out of harmony with God's love. Yeah. Completely out of harmony with the way God created love to be. But, so, but again, we get more about God's nature here, don't we? We do, yeah. Well, just the fact that God is the bestower of every good and perfect gift. Everything we've ever received. Everything we've received that's good and perfect and loving has come from, come from God. God. So, wow, this is a God I'd like to have some faith in. Exactly. Um, well, who wouldn't? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, but also... I feel this is a this paragraph talks to me about humility as well and my yeah. self reliance. In my self reliance, I often want to feel that I'm the creator of every good and perfect thing in my life, <laughs> yeah. and, God's and God's the, the creator of every nasty yes, thing. Yes, and it's God's laws and God's problem that I'm in pain. And if it was only left up to me, uh, you know, everything would be good and perfect. Yeah, a complete false belief. And this paragraph <laughs> is telling me it's it's the complete, complete flip side. Inverse. It's telling me everything good and perfect in my life has come from God. And actually the only reason I'm in pain and the only thing that prevents love flowing is, is my will. So it's saying actually, hang on, tables are turned. Exactly, get the perspectives right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you want to have a relationship with God, you're going to have to get your perspective right. <laughs> yeah. So and I'm going to, and one of the biggest lessons I feel God is always trying to teach us is that we have a will. Yes. And the importance of our will. And how much power, how power our will is. has. And God gave us this power to exercise it. Yeah. And Even so, that gift came from God. Yes. And it can be good and perfect if we exercise it to ask for the love. And if we exercise it in harmony with the love and yeah. in harmony with all God's laws, which are all loving. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, another very important paragraph to understand truly if you really want to seek God's love, yeah. right? And, and um, just finally there... Yeah. In this prayer, we're asking for faith even to believe these things. So yep. we're asking, you know, can, let help me, me believe. Help me believe this, God. Help as me well. believe that you are this person. Yeah, yeah. You know, and also help me to believe that it's not my mum and dad that are my parents. You know, he's saying, yes. it's saying here, cause me to know that you are my parent, you are my father, not my mum and dad. My mum and dad just give me the bodies, you know, yeah. they're not my real mum and dad. Yeah. You are my mum and dad. Yeah. And help me believe and, and cause me to have the faith to believe that, yep. that my real mum and dad, no matter how badly I was treated by this mum and dad on earth or how well I was treated by this mum and dad on earth, they are still not my mum and dad. Mm. You're my mum and dad. It's, it's almost like let me give them up as the, the people who are in direction of my life, whether they were kind and generous or, or, or mean and nasty or, or a anywhere good, mix, in between. <laughs> good mix at different times. Exactly. Let me give up these people as the figurehead of my life yeah. and put you, God, and let me have such faith as to realise I'm your child, not their child. And also under this uh, concept, I would no longer hold on to the concept that my mum and dad must be listened to anymore. Yes. That my mum and dad must be honoured or all these other particular things. Because, because the reality is if I, if I honour this relationship, I will come to understand the true relationship between myself and my earthly parents, mm. uh, which is very, very different to the actual relationship between my soul and my heavenly parent. Mm. And I'll come to see that whenever the earthly parents demand things of me that are out of harmony with love, then, then I will always honour my relationship with God in this. And I'll always honour, no, God's not like that. <laughs> God's not like that. God's my father. You're not my father. You're just you're this creator of my body, and that didn't take very long either. <laughs> you know, for for the for the dad, it took him an instant usually, <laughs> and for the mum, maybe nine longer. months. Yeah. But but even then, it's not very long. It's yeah. like um, and anything gifts that they've given us as a result, and they have given us gifts. Our parents yes. in the result in, in creating us, they gave us gifts. Many parents have given us gifts, even though we honour the fact that we have received gifts from them. They are our brothers and sisters. We are, we are fellow children of God mm -hmm. and we come to understand that. Mm -hmm. and, and when I understand that, I start understanding the need to honour God as my parent rather than put my honour in my parents on earth as my parent. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and when I say rather than, I mean, I mean there are times when my parents will not deserve my honour right? because of the actions that they take that are out of harmony with my 
heavenly parent. Yeah, and it's you're really saying, isn't it, that um, I will stop honouring my parents above myself. Exactly. Instead, honour us equally. Equally. And then place God in the position of of, of where, true honour. Where I seek guidance, where I seek love, where yeah. I seek where know, I seek honor. everything that I need. Uh, yes. In fact, yes. Yeah. yes. Not yes. from my parents anymore. My parents are just fellow brothers and sisters who can also have the same relationship with God that I have. Yeah. 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 Okay, so let me never cease to realise that your love is waiting for each and all of us and that when I come to you in faith and earnest aspiration, your love will never be withheld from me. Mm. This is not telling us more about God's love. God never withholds love from us. So if we are asking for love and not receiving it, there's a problem in us. Mm -hmm. There's something going wrong in us that causes us to have a lack of sincerity about the asking. Yeah. It's, and I, I constantly see people blaming God for not receiving divine love. They say, oh, I pray every day, but I don't seem to receive divine love. That in itself is a blame of God. Yeah. Right? Because if you're not receiving divine love and you pray every day, you're not looking at what's going on inside of you. Mm. you, you you, you're wanting to blame something external to yourself for not receiving love. God desires to never withhold love mm. when it's asked for with earnest aspirations. It will always be given. So if it's not being received, then it's not being received because of something you're doing, not because of something God's doing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's that, again, in this paragraph, to me there's the, the flip side even of, I mean, it's such a beautiful prayer and it's so full of truth if if we come to it with our own injuries and our own hearts so what you've just said is okay i'm praying every day i'm praying every day and i'm not receiving love now some of us can go oh god you know blame yeah. god yeah but what and because i said earlier you know i suffer with the opposite, opposite problem, problem yeah. uh, in this paragraph it tells me that God's love is always waiting for me. Always. There's never an expiry date. There's never a time where now I've really blown it and I'm never getting <laughs> exactly, the love. Exactly, exactly. And it's not just for a special few. It's for every Everyone. single one of us, whether we feel so lowly or, you know, think we're the bee's knees. It yeah. doesn't matter. God's love is always, always there available. for us. And I had a Christian this week email me and he was trying to convince me that, that um, God... God chose the people God loves, right? Okay, what? Like God chooses to love everyone, yeah. you know? Like this is a man who has no understanding of God's nature at all yeah. because, you know, now that I know the Bible does say in some parts that God chooses people to love, but it's not true at all. It's not true at all. Yeah. God doesn't choose them. They choose themselves by having a desire <laughs> for love well, to, to enter. God has chosen Every single one of his children. <laughs> yeah, God, from God's perspective, God wants every single one of the children yeah. to receive yeah. divine love. And the, their children choose through their, their actions and desires. Yeah. And, and, you know, if, if a Christian has a concept that God's chosen, they are already out of harmony with God's nature. Yeah. God's not like that. God doesn't arbitrarily say, oh, I choose you. And, oh, Eagle, who's behind the camera there, I don't choose him. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's... Just uh, something that God just would not do. Mm -hmm. God chooses everyone, of course. So these are all concepts, again, about God that we've got to give up. So if I hold on to the concept that God chooses people, I am not going to receive love beyond a certain point because I can't. Because I'm, I'm, I'm exercising my will to hold on to a belief system that any love inside of me would be opposing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so That's your it. next yeah. answer. Yeah. Oh, this is a well-worn part of the prayer for me. <laughs> uh, keep me in the shadow of your love every hour and moment of my life and help me to overcome all the temptations of the flesh and the influence of the powers of the evil ones who so constantly surround me and endeavour to th turn my thoughts away from you to the pleasures and allurements of this world. Mm. So... Again, this tells us a lot about God. Yes. Like God, every time we make mistakes, God doesn't go, or, or we are overcome by the temptations of the flesh. God's not going, oh, I'm going to punish you now. I'm going to make your life difficult now. We've got to correct this now, you know, and, and put all this heaviness on you. 
God wants to help you overcome the temptations of the flesh. And in fact, receiving God's love into your soul helps you overcome the temptations of the flesh mm -hmm. by removing the actual cause of why you're tempted. Yes. That's how God's love operates. Yeah. And as long as we're open to that occurring, then that, that transformational power can occur. So, and, and God's constantly wanting us to live in the shadow of love, not in you know, the dark shadows of hatred, revenge and other things that we often are, uh, and anger and rage that we're often overcome by. Mm -hmm. God wants us to live in the shadow of God's love. Now, if we believe God's love, love involves wrath, of course, we might believe that God's that living in the shadow of love means that we can also get wrathful. But that's not the case at all. No. It's a false belief. God is never wrathful. Mm. So, so, so when we're living in the shadow of God's love, after a while, as we, we engage that more and more, we slowly become naturally never wrathful yeah. as a result. Yeah. And, and I suppose for me, this part of the prayer has been a lot about spirit influence mm -hmm. and the influence of the powers of the evil ones who constantly surround me and endeavour to turn my thoughts away from you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this part of the prayer tells me that asking God for help in those times when I feel bombarded and I feel there's a lot of pressure on me to turn away from faith in God to the worldly view, which can be very negative and um, cynical. Yep. So I can ask yep. for God uh, to help me and also that this sh keep me in the shadow of your love. To me, that's about faith in God's love and the faith in the power of love. Mm -hmm. But it's also about asking divine angels, <laughs> you know, asking people who are at one with God to also surround me, that, that I can call upon people in the shadow of God's love as well. To... But, but we also must understand from this yes, paragraph too yes. that God created laws that allow evil ones to surround me. Absolutely. Now those laws are loving laws and we need to come to understand they're loving laws. So if evil ones do surround me, I would need to start to begin, if I understood this paragraph correctly, I would need to begin to understand that I attract them in some way, mm. that there's something inside of me that causes an attraction between them and their influence and what's happening in my life. And I will start to understand the power that I have in this process. See, a lot of people read this uh, paragraph, I feel, and then feel that like, God should protect them from all evil. Well, no. no. God's laws would protect them from all evil if there was no evil within their soul yeah. that needed to be released. But the fact is that if there is evil in the soul, there, is, there are emotions in the soul that need to be released that are out of harmony with love, then those emotions will cause an attraction. And we need to understand that God is not the, the cause of our negative attractions. Mm. It is our own desires, as it says there, the temptations of flesh and our own desires, and our desire to live in harmony with different spirits who are evil around us that cause the attractions. Mm. Yeah, and in this it does say, help me to overcome. That. So, yes, so it's saying it's based on my will. Exactly. Help yeah. me to overcome what is happening in my life here, to actually see that I am the creator of it and that I need to, through some process, become the destroyer of it yes. if I'm going to become happy. And help me see that I, as a result of me being the creator, you will, you will give me help to overcome the reasons why I created these yes. things Yes. as well. Yeah. And that's a very loving God. It gives you help even when you go and create evil and then as a result of the subsequent evil, you act upon it and you cause sin and suffering, pain and suffering as a result to come upon you and others, that the loving God is still trying to help you overcome it all. Yes. Not, he's not going, I'm going to put you in the deepest of the hells and punish you for the rest of your existence, as many people would believe, yeah. but rather he's doing completely the opposite. He's trying to lift us up constantly as a person who loves us would do. Yeah. A person who truly loves us would lift us up, not constantly degrade us and degrade us and degrade us, punish us and so forth, but a person who loves us would lift us up instead, yeah. constantly, whether we wanted to be degraded or not, immaterial to that. But that person will continually want to lift us up. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, I suppose, the times when I feel so much uh, the influence of the powers of the evil, of evil ones, 
is when I lack faith. Mm -hmm. That is really their gateway. It's when I lack faith in this wonderful God yeah. and when I lack faith in the power of love. Yeah. And so, and um, in the and faith in the fact that if you act in harmony with law, everything will come out good. Yes, yep. that that will help me overcome. Yes, and so um, this keeping me in the shadow of your love it often stirs those kinds of feelings for me about yeah. hang on, keep me in this faith place with you yeah. because that's going to help me overcome these yeah. the power and the truth that comes from. Be, you know, holding on to the truth about God is what creates my faith. And, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So you can see already, and uh, it's something probably we will mention at the end of the prayer, but if you, see, you can see already the prayer has been carefully constructed. I'm a very logical person. <laughs> and it's been carefully constructed to help a person expose within themselves all of their false beliefs about themselves and God. Mm. That's, that's why I constructed the prayer in the manner that I did, so that it would help expose the false beliefs about both things. And that's why it's so important for a person to truly understand the principles relating around the prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, whose turn? It's your turn. I, th I thank you for your love and the privilege of receiving it. And I believe that you are my father, the loving father, who smiles upon me in my weakness and is always ready to help me and take me into your arms of love. Now, I feel that this particular paragraph confronted many people, even now or, and also in the first century, because, because firstly, it is a privilege to receive love. It's not a given. It's not a, something we can demand. It's a privilege to get it. So we need to exercise some gratitude for the fact that we have been given this privilege to receive love. That's firstly. Secondly, our Father smiles upon us in our weaknesses. God doesn't look at it in rage and anger when we display our weaknesses. Or he, uh, criticism and uh, negativity. No, or in judgment mm -hmm. or any of those things. God just, just has a loving feeling of sympathy and compassion for our weaknesses. And, and if we understood that this is the kind of God that we, would, we are entering a relationship with, Surely we'd want to enter a relationship with such a person because the reality is on this planet we don't receive much compassion or sympathy when we're, when we're weak. Mm. In fact, the majority of people attack and attack and attack. Like, or, like if I make a single mistake, we, we have thousands of people emailing us in attack, just me making a single mistake. Like God never does that. Mm. God, God is much more loving than that. God smiles upon me in any, with any weakness that I might have or any, or any mistake that I might make and tries to encourage me through the operation of the love to do better next time. Mm -hmm. That's how God feels about me. And, and while I believe that, I will not accept people attacking me saying, God's going to punish you and God's going to make you feel this and God's going to put you in hell. You know, how many people, Christians in particular, but all sorts of people, even people who are not, don't believe in God at all, tell me all these bad things that are going to happen to me as a result of me claiming, just claiming to be Jesus, for example. Yeah. Now, let's say the claim is false. And, and let's say that I am a sincere person who wants to teach people how to love. Then, then God will correct me. There's no need for you to correct me. Mm. <laughs> God will correct me through a process. Yeah. Right? And, and this process will be the same loving process that I've been engaged with for 2,000 years with God. It is the same beautiful loving process because that's the kind of person God is. God's not the kind of person that the majority of people want to email me and tell me God is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And for me, that paragraph... I've always felt privileged, so it's never really struck me. Yeah, you feel so privileged that you feel like you don't deserve yes. it, <laughs> which is a problem. Yeah, and so for me that paragraph is always about, I thank you for your love. Now that statement, I have to have faith in that statement, that the love even exists for me. For you personally, yes. For me personally. Yeah. So it's, an, it's a, 
It's a very affirming part of the prayer. And also yeah. that you are always ready for me. There's these same themes that are what strikes me emotionally yeah. as I read it. You know, And um, it's important, isn't it, to see that God has this personal desire yeah. to have a personal relationship with you personally. <laughs> yes. <and laughs> not, not, not some global desire, <laughs> just have a relationship with, with all of mankind generally. Exactly. <laughs> and that, that brings up all kinds of unworthiness in me. And yeah. it's so personal that it, you even give this beautiful image of God taking me in his arms, yeah. you know, this very personal... And that's how I often feel it, love. like yeah. just for, for being held in the arms of God. Yeah. Or I liken it to sometimes just sitting on God's lap, yes. you know, yeah. and getting educated by this loving father yeah. 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 or it's, mother. It's very mm. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I pray this with all the earnestness and sincere longings of my soul and trusting in your love give you all the glory and honour and love that my finite soul can give. Mm. Another very important aspect of the prayer yes. is, that, is that we firstly need to trust that God has love to give us. Mm -hmm. We need to pray in earnestness and longing. So this is a statement of our own truthful state. If, if, we're, not, if we're not in a state of truth and we're not earnest and we're not sincere, then the love cannot enter us, yes. right? Yeah. And so I need to look at my own lack of sincerity. Yeah. I need to look at my own lack of earnestness mm. if I'm not receiving love. Yeah. But also that God deserves my glory and honour and love. Yes. So this is something, something that we, many people do not understand about God is this. God gave us this gift of free will. That means that there are some things that God cannot take from us ever. Mm. And one of those things is our will. God will never take our will away from us. God also doesn't take love from us. So God, God rejoices whenever we willingly express our love for God. Yes. This is way, a way we can make God's heart glad or more gladder than it already is. <laughs> and the most people don't understand that. Most people don't get the fact that God becomes happier than God already is when we express our love for God. And that nobody else can give the love that I have for God to God. To God. And nobody else can give God's love that God has for you to you. Mm. Only God can give that to you. It's a personal engagement mm. between you and God. Only, and God will never demand your love from you, and you can never demand God's love from God. Mm. Right. To do so would be out of harmony with the laws of will. But also that's the nature of love, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that's teaching us about love. And teaching us about what pure love on the earth would be when it's expressed between, between partners people. or between yeah. children and parents and so forth. We would never be demanding. Yeah. We, would never, we would never take from the person or demand that the person loves us because we realise that love is a gift a gift that is given freely by the soul of the individual, whether that soul is God's, the great oversoul of our universe, or our puny little soul, <laughs> it doesn't matter. The fact is that if we honoured the love and we honoured the gift of free will, we would understand the privilege of receiving love from another. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an immense privilege because it's the one thing that we cannot ever demand from them. We, you know, If they are giving us love that's based on demand, it's not love. It's bartering. It's not love. To, for somebody to give a feeling of love towards us without, without ever being demanded or, or also, um, as, as we said here, here that uh, you know, given in the sort of the spirit of feeling that we deserve it. Yes, and entitlement. That we're entitled. Yeah. And th these particular emotions are out of harmony with love completely. And so when we learn about that with God, we start to understand God's nature is so fine and pure that God never even demands anything from us. Mm. That God only he desires our love and is overjoyed when he receives it, but does not ever demand it. Mm. And that's an amazing gift if you think about it. And it also that means we can give a gift to God. Yeah. So God's 
through this relationship, given us the ability to give a gift back to God. Not the gift of our will or anything else, but the gift of our love. Mm. We have this ability to, to give this gift in return if we desire to. Yeah. So as a lot of people say, we've got nothing to give God. There's nothing that we can give God that God doesn't already have. I can't agree. There is things that we can give God that God doesn't already have because God created it that way. Our love is one of those things that we can give to God that God doesn't already have. And our will is another that we can bring in harmony with God that God doesn't already have. Mm. These are gifts that God gave us already. Yeah, and that's probably my strongest memory of being in such a close relationship with God is that I can connect to. And I don't know if many people understand that as you become at one with God, your desire to give glory and honour to God is it, immense. It's immense. Mm -hmm. it, it directs your whole <clears throat> life. Mm -hmm. And you desire that God be honoured and glorified, not True. out of duty, but because it is such a heartfelt, passionate desire within you. Yeah. Because you feel and it's driven by so much gratitude. Privilege, yeah. yes. You, yeah, you feel the privilege and how of receiving God's love and how transformative it has been and the utter gift and, of it, the fact that... And what it's created it, in your life, eh? Yeah, mm. how what it's created, the potential it's unlocked in you mm. and the fact that... It's a gift. It's not something that God had to give to you. Mm. And that understanding that just then generates so much feeling of um, the glory of God and the, yep. the desire to honour God. And it would also, a... if you think about it, if we sincerely felt it, it would also increase our desire for prayer. Yes. Always. Yeah. It's mm. sort of this whole uh, becomes this self uh feeding kind of a cycle of like um loving god receiving god's love desiring more of god's love feeling god's love unlocking things and you feeling the gratitude for that then yep. feeling you want to love god even more and this whole expansion happens yep. and i don't really know what it's like on god's end but it's pretty powerful on our end yeah. isn't it yeah yeah and, and so it, now that we've sort of discussed Solomon's message in a bit more detail, where he said the greatest thing in the world, the greatest truths in the world are prayer and faith on the part of mortals and love, the divine love on the part of God. Yeah. The latter is waiting and the former causes it to enter into the souls of men. No other truths are so great and momentous to men. Mm. And, and that, I feel, is the, is the thing we need to bear in mind. And if... If we ever lose our way on the path to God, you know, all we need to do is go back to those three things. Yeah, I think that's why I love this message so much. And yep. when I view um, the scope of what you've taught and what the level of information that's available out there, I see that you understand this, these greatest truths from Solomon and they direct everything that in your life. Mm. Yep. <laughs> you understand this very clearly. Yep. And, and I see you understanding it even as you're teaching other things. And all these other things that you teach are all designed to give us awareness so that we can grow humility, mm -hmm. to Understand grow our your faith, own soul, to our know, what, yeah, to know um, the, the beauty of God, even understand the potentials yes. and also our soul and, and all these other things that are all designed really to help us just engage faith, and prayer. Exactly. But I see some people lose sight of that. Yeah. Des decide because this idea of really trying the experiment that Solomon and, and you encouraged in the messages, because that sometimes feels risky, or, or, or initially it often feels risky, and because we have all these false beliefs about God and we're not challenging them with these new truths you're presenting, mm. then... then People can go down the side road of trying to get more truths, come to another seminar, focus on emotions, do all these other things that are really bypassing the fact that if we just engage with faith and prayer, mm. all of these other things will, will start to be engaged even more intensely. Certainly. And, and all the truths that I have delivered to people are all a subsequent, are a part of that effort to help people understand the operation of their own soul. Yeah. 
and their operation of their of the soul's connection with God's soul, yes. and and but but I also feel sometimes that if people would just spend more time praying, as I encourage my first century disciples to do, yeah. rather than spending all this time trying to understand everything I've said, they would actually understand everything I said far better <laughs> than what they currently do. And if people spent more time receiving divine love than they did on any other thing, mm. they, they would actually, in fact, progress much more rapidly than they currently do. And they'd also be happier in their progress than they currently are. Mm. Because it's not, it's not the traumatic process that I see people think it is. Um, it hasn't been a traumatic process for me. I've had to pro- cry a lot. Like, I've, I, as I've explained to people, sometimes I've cried for three months straight, you know, like mm. for four or five hours a day. But... I never found that, uh, I just found that as a normal subsequent part of my receiving divine love and having certain things inside of me triggered so that I needed to feel them and I was humble enough to feel them for that length of time. Mm-hmm. So, so I feel again that people need to understand the basic principles and the basic principles are God has this, this love that transforms your soul. It's the only thing that's going to forever transform your soul, the only thing. Mm-hmm. Nothing else you do will ever transform your soul. And beyond the sixth dimension of the spirit world, there is nothing you can do personally to transform your own soul. Mm. There's nothing you can personally do. So why not give that up now and start instead engaging this process with God where God's love transforms your soul? And to do that, you only need two things. You only need prayer and faith. Mm. When I say only, they're two very <laughs> important things. Yeah. They, they also involve in many different facets which, which if we engage the prayer that I gave to people in the first century and in the pageant messages, they will find that they actually engage the process and, and they'll find that many of the, much of the faith that is necessary to receive divine love will come to them as a result of their longings being, being inspired. But they also are going to need to be willing to let go of their own impediments to receiving divine love. Mm. Only we ourselves can stop the process through the exercise of our will. And I see a lot of people using their will, even people who believe themselves to be followers of divine truth and on the divine love path, using their will actively in denial of the truth, in denial of the reception of love. And of course, you can't really see love very fast if you're going to deny its reception. So I would suggest to people to reconsider their actions and reconsider their daily practices and allow themselves to see that no matter what their condition, whether they think it's very, very good or they think it's very, very bad, they can receive divine love. And if they are not receiving divine love, it's because of something that they themselves are choosing to do that's out of harmony with the necessary faith we need to receive love from God. And I feel if we, if we understood those particular things, then we would come to understand Solomon's message more carefully. So hopefully you've enjoyed our discussion of Solomon's message. It's quite an involved discussion for just a few lines <laughs> in, the, in, in the book of uh, messages that we've received from, uh, that people have received through Paget. But uh, it, it contains many of the, and all of, the basic truths that we need to have a relationship and establish a relationship with God. And if we understand it completely, we will understand the truth of those particular messages properly. So myself and Mary would like to thank you for our time. We've had a few little interruptions in between because we need to, do, to go away and process some emotions <laughs> yes. of our own. So we've done that and, uh, and hopefully you've enjoyed our discussion on, on this particular message. What is the greatest thing or the greatest truths in all the world by Solomon. Thanks for your time.